that helps me filter out the comments from other people that I know are not true, who don't really know me, who no matter what I say, they're going to call me all sorts of names. So I have to remember whose opinion really matters and that other people who don't know me at all um, and who just want to, you know, malign me and, and slander me, that really their opinion doesn't define me, doesn't shape who I am, and it doesn't determine my future either. Joining us now is podcast host, author, commentator, and speaker, Allie Beth Stuckey. Uh, Allie, I'm so thankful that you're on the program. I've, I've admired the way that you've been able to think through tough issues going on in the culture and then articulate them so clearly, particularly to a, a young crowd who's often uh, confused by so much um, slithery double talk that's coming to them through the media, and you're a clear voice for these things. So uh, appreciate you being on Takeaways. Well, thank you so much for having me, and thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate that. So you've really become known as a cultural commentator. You're a millennial who's not afraid to talk about tough topics from a biblical perspective. What got you interested in that line of work? I have been at least vaguely interested in politics for a very long time. I mean, one of my first and most vivid memories is the Bush-Gore election and staying up as late as my parents would let me to make sure that my candidate won. And so I've always been kind of interested in what's going on in a political and cultural level. I decided during the 2016 election, because I lived in a college town, that I kind of had a cool opportunity. I started to reach out to sororities uh, at the University of Georgia, asking if it was okay if I could just come to their chapter meetings, give a presentation that I had created on my own about why they should vote. It was nonpartisan, but I just wanted to encourage them to get involved in the political process, to care about the things that were going on. And then I started getting emails from these students asking for you know my perspective on different topics. And that's when I started a blog actually in 2016 called The Conservative Millennial, which then it was kind of known that that was like a paradoxical phrase. It was a little bit ironic. And so started making those videos. And then after a year or so of that, that turned into kind of a full-time career. I started working at The Blaze in 2017. Then by 2018, I started my podcast, Relatable. And really all this time, it's just kind of been growing organically. So yeah, it's been fun and it's been a it's been a crazy journey over the past few years. Well, I think that you are uniquely gifted to talk about these things because a, a lot of people talk about it at home, in private, with their spouse or with their kids where there's no opposition, but you actually go right to the front lines in your podcast and on the news. Do you think that you were just made for this kind of a job? I mean, some people would say, I just, I don't like to argue and fight, but you don't really argue and fight. You're talking about these things with a lot of confidence. Um, is that hard? Is that challenging? Or does that come really natural? It's definitely challenging. I think it's both, but do I enjoy also being on the front lines and talking about these controversial issues? Yes, of course. There's a part of me that gets a lot of energy from that. Now, I don't like being intentionally inflammatory or provocative or anything like that. I don't want to cause controversy. But the things today that are considered controversial, my main argument is that for the Christian, they're not. Um, most of the things that we talk about are really pre-political in the sense that the definition of the family or gender or when life starts inside the womb, yes, those have become controversial political issues. But for the Christian, those are really Genesis 1 issues. We're talking about foundational theological issues. So what I'm trying to do, albeit very imperfectly as a fallible person, is to talk about how, how do these pre-political issues, these really biblical issues, inform how we look at what are now, you know, policies and culture war issues and things like that. How do you handle the backlash from people who disagree with you, that begin to, to, to use terms to describe you that is everything you don't want to be described as, as yeah. a Christian, as a follower of Christ? How do you handle that? It, you know, it is difficult. I'm not going to pretend like, oh, you know, I love it when people call me names and it just, you know, slides right off me like Teflon. That's not the case. I mean, there are some things that, of course, hurt my feelings, but you do have to, you have to have, uh, you know, tough skin. And it does kind of build up over time, kind of like a callus, like it protects you from taking all of those things personally. I think obviously the biggest thing that helps is knowing who I am in Christ and knowing that he 
fully knows my heart and my intentions. And when they're wrong, hopefully the Holy Spirit, you know, convicts me of those things. But I also have people in my life who I know will be honest with me. Having my family, having my friends who I know will tell me the truth about what I'm saying, how it's coming across, um, you know, how I'm conducting my business, whatever it is, that helps me filter out the comments from other people that I know are not true, who don't really know me, who no matter what I say, they're going to call me all sorts of names. So I have to remember whose opinion really matters and that other people who don't know me at all um, and who just want to, you know, malign me and, and slander me, that really their opinion doesn't define me, doesn't shape who I am, and it doesn't determine my future either. That's a great lesson for all of us, no matter what we do for a living. How do you form a biblical perspective on a subject that the Bible doesn't speak specifically to? For instance, what kind of movies should I watch? What kind of music should I listen to? Who should I vote for uh, when it comes to my school board uh, or my, you know, my governor's race or yeah. the presidential election? Or what you know, gender expression is really all about when we don't find those terms in the scriptures themselves. Well, we do find the basic principles of all of those things in scripture themselves. So of course, we're not going to see the word gender expression or gender identity, just for example, in the Bible. But we do see in the first chapter of the Bible that God made the male and female. And so right there from the very beginning, I can look at the creation order and I can see that that creation order is reiterated throughout scripture. It's repeated by Jesus himself in Matthew 19 when he says, haven't you heard that a man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become one flesh? And of course, we see the commandment uh, in, the t in the Ten Commandments that we are to honor our father and mother. And so even though we don't see terms like gender identity or gay marriage or transgender or things like that, um, we see what God says is. That's actually something, um, an error that I see a lot of people make that says, well, Jesus never said this word. Or the Bible doesn't say abortion. And so that means that it's fine. So it's kind of an argument from absence. Because the Bible doesn't use our modern political or cultural terms, that means that Jesus was fine with it. But we're not supposed to read the Bible and say, well, what does the Bible say specifically that we can't do so we can see what we can get away with? Rather, mm. we look at the Bible and say, but what does it say? How do we positively define these things? God positively defines marriages between a man and a woman. He positively defines gender and sex as really the same categories, male and female. So I don't need to look for the modern terminology in an ancient text. The principles are all there. Ali, you have a podcast. You're having a whole series called Most Misused, discussing passages in yes. scripture that are most misused by people within the family of faith and people outside the family of faith. Uh, how, do, how does that happen? The Bible's pretty clear. How do people end up misusing these verses? I have misused these verses and misunderstood these verses myself. And so I'm coming from a place of, wow, I learned over time um, that I was maybe misapplying, for example, Psalm 37, 4, that if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. There was probably one time in my faith where I thought that that meant, well, whatever I want, God is promising that he is going to give it to me, that my desires are indicative of God's will. And really, that's not what it means. It means that if you are delighting yourself in the Lord, that your desire will be God's will. And so that's kind of what we do. Mm. You know, Philippians 4, 13 uh, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. A lot of times we kind of decontextualize these verses and we apply them to our specific situation in a way that makes us feel like we are going to accomplish our desired goal. And maybe we will, and maybe they are applicable. But really what I found in doing that and decontextualizing it, I think that's the big problem that all of us have probably done at one point. Um, you actually miss what this verse actually means. And in doing that, you miss the gospel truth that's within it. So rather than just saying that, you know, uh, Philippians 4.13 means I'm going to like win my soccer game or that I'm going to get this promotion, it's actually talking about something much bigger than that. I mean, Paul is writing from prison. He is talking about a much bigger trial, a much deeper struggle than that. And wow, what a better truth that even in famine and in persecution and in potential martyrdom, that that, that that verse is saying that we can get through that with Christ's strength. Here's another verse that I hear quoted all of the time, and it's a beautiful verse. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your well-being, not for, for disaster, to give you a future and to give you a hope. I think um, one of my family members even has this verse tattooed on their body. Um, how is that verse often misused, and what's the real meaning? 
Yeah, so that's a wonderful verse. And of course, there is good reason why people would want to use that as a motto. And it's not necessarily wrong, of course, to cite it and to say that's a wonderful thing about God. But of course, like if you look at Jeremiah 29 and you're looking at um, you're looking at Israel in exile, like what is God actually talking about here? There's a lot of historical and cultural and even theological scriptural context when it comes to this verse and what he is actually talking about. And because they're in exile, like they're going through something really hard. I mean, they're in Babylon and God is saying, hey, I have plans to prosper you. He's obviously not promising that their life is going to be easy or that they're going to get everything that they want or that they are going to accomplish all of their goals because they're right in the thick of suffering and struggling right then. So I think that is probably one of the mistakes that we make, that we kind of decontextualize that verse and we say, kind of like a lot of the other verses, well, that means that God has in store the things that I want him to have in store for me. But if you look at the context of scripture as a whole, like we know that actually God promises us trouble. We, he promises us forms of persecution. He promises us trials and he promises joy and peace and hope in the midst of those. But he does not say the mark of a Christian life or the mark of a happy Christian life is that God is going to give us all of the things that we define as good. Hey, we're halfway through this interview. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share this video with a friend. Now back to the interview. We're back with Allie Beth Stuckey. I'm so enjoying this conversation that we're having. Uh, Allie, you've written a book called You're Not Enough and That's Okay, Escaping the Toxic Culture of Self-Love. And then in the very beginning of the book, you talk about your own struggle with this issue of self-love. Can you just um, recount that journey for us? So I decided to write this book, I think it was in 2018, because I just noticed that a lot of my fellow women and especially fellow Christian women were talking a lot about self-love, self-care, self-empowerment. And it was just strange that I was hearing this from Christian women and Christians are supposed to die to self. And actually scripture said that in the end days, people will be lovers of self and they don't say that in a good way. And so I kind of thought that this was strange. But then when I, I realized I was kind of looking back at my own journey in life, I realized that I had kind of struggled with this idea too of wanting to be the solution to my problems, wanting to be enough for myself, trying to prove that I am self-sufficient, that I didn't need God, that I didn't need his rules. And I think that's what a lot of women are doing today when they're latching on to kind of the self-love movement. So for me, it was really, it started in college and I was raised a Christian in a Christian home and I really did take my faith seriously um, end of high school, beginning of college. And then I, um, a, a few things happened, which I talk about in the book that kind of sent me into this spiral of trying to figure out who I was, what my purpose was. I had kind of a crisis of faith. My senior year of high school, I started uh, drinking too much. I had bad relationships. I ended up having an eating disorder and it was all really trying to find acceptance and wanting to be loved and wanting to be wanted and really wanting to be enough and trying to prove that I didn't need the boyfriend that I had had. I didn't need God. I didn't need any, anyone. I could be fulfilled and have fun and be independent without needing anyone else. And certainly without needing any standards or rules. And that obviously put me at a dead end. Now, thankfully, providentially, as I talk about in the book, there was a Christian counselor who rather than just, you know, coddling me and telling me a lot of the things that unfortunately women hear today, um, she just said, look, you are killing yourself through this eating disorder and through this destructive behavior. And if you want to die when you're 22 or 23, keep it up, basically. And I didn't want that, really. The image of that happening, the idea of that happening and kind of coming to terms with the fact mm. that I was addicted to the li to a lifestyle that was sinful, but that also wasn't good for me. And that I could really hurt the people around me. It really kind of stopped me in my tracks. And then I had let sin get so far and I had let things snowball so much, even though I knew better. And it really just filled me with a lot of shame. And I know that shame is typically used today in a completely negative sense. We're told that we're not supposed to feel ashamed of anything, but I actually think that we are supposed to feel ashamed of sin. I think we're supposed to be, feel really sad and really grieved over sin. And it took a Christian counselor telling me a really hard truth um, and mm -hmm. telling me what my destructive behavior was doing 
to kind of, I don't know, awaken that shame in me. And I really thank the Lord for that shame. Like I thank the Lord for feeling so guilty and so bad and so sad over just how far I had gone and his faithfulness to me and sharing that hard truth with me and bringing me back. Um, and what I realized in all of that, of course, later, as I'm thinking through this, these messages that we see on social media, that you are enough, you're good enough the way you are, you're perfect the way you are, all of these things is that I had actually bought into those lies. And so I talked to a lot of different women as I was writing this book, like, did you have you struggled with these lies? Um, there was one woman that I talk about in the book, she uh, was she was a mother and she had two babies right in a row. And, you know, for moms who are in that newborn stage, you're in the thick of it. It is so hard. And gosh, if you ever know that you're not enough, it's kind of in those days when you're so tired and your energy is just zapped. But she said that she was turning to um, these Facebook groups that were telling her that, you know, all she needs to do is focus on herself. All she needs to do is, you know, more self-care and more self-focus and really kind of talked about her kids as she, as they were burdens. And she really turned to this stuff to try to make herself feel better. Long story short, um, that didn't work. She actually ended up um, being almost suicidal. And it wasn't until again, she kind of had this reckoning with her husband and telling him, you know, how she's struggling and all of that, that she realized that actually the journey to trying to be enough, to try to be enough for yourself, for your kids or your husband, that actually depletes you. It actually exhausts you. Um, we're not enough. And the good news of the book is that that's not just okay. It's really good news because Christ is our sufficiency. If we were enough for our salvation, for our sanctification, for our strength, we would not need Christ. But we needed him so much that he actually died on the cross, a brutal death that he did not deserve because we're insufficient. Our sufficiency in all things, salvation and otherwise, comes from Christ and trying to find our sufficiency in ourselves or elsewhere, it's just going to exhaust us. So how do we balance self-care with yeah. not being too self-focused? Because we're stewards of this body, this life. How do we balance those? Yeah, you said it exactly right, that we are stewards of this life and we are stewards of this body. And we see in... Uh, the creation of the Sabbath, that obviously we are meant to rest, that God knows that we are meant to rest. He made our bodies to actually need sleep. He made our bodies to need leisure. Uh, we also know that he has given us so many gifts of common grace, meaning that people of all different backgrounds can enjoy them. That means, you know, good food, sex, sleep, vacation, all of these things that he has given us that we certainly have the privilege of being able to enjoy. Um, and so we can embrace those things, knowing that God has created us for that balance. Um, but also, I think that it is a matter of your mentality and also your heart. Like you use the word stewardship, the idea of stewardship that, okay, I need to rest. I need to rejuvenate. I need to take a step back. I need to enjoy these good blessings in my life that God has given me just for the sake of enjoyment. Um, that I am stewarding my time well, that I'm stewarding my body well, that I'm stewarding my work well, that is very different than an attitude of entitlement. That if I don't get my, you know, Saturday night with my girls, then that means that I am basically oppressed by my schedule, that my kids are a burden, and that I am not getting everything that I deserve. When we think of God as our shepherd and God as our caretaker and God is the one who takes care of us and we see the different opportunities for rest as really gifts from him while also knowing that if we don't get the breaks that we think that we need because we know as parents, they just don't always come, that he's going to be our sustaining strength. I think that's a different mentality than what we see from kind of the secular self-love, self-care culture, which is that you are entitled to a certain amount and a certain kind of basically just like self-serving time um, when that's not necessarily true. We're not necessarily entitled to that. And at different stages of life with different responsibilities that we have, rest looks different and we have to be okay with that and be grateful for the opportunities of rest and leisure that God gives us. In your book, you also dispel a couple of other notions like you're entitled to your dreams and you can't love others until you love yourself. Would you just grab one of those and explain to us why that's not a good idea? Yeah, so I'll do the last one. You can't love other people until you love yourself because I hear it so often because people 
um, misunderstand, this is the most misused, when Jesus says, you know, when we're told to love our neighbor as ourselves, we're told that that's, you know, some people say that's also a directive to love ourselves, but that's not actually what Jesus is saying. He is saying loving yourself is really a given, that we are born loving ourselves. And I know people push back on that, but what I mean by that isn't that we think that we're pretty or isn't that we like ourselves all the time or that we feel affection towards ourselves. What I think Jesus means and what it means to have an innate love of yourself means that you are always seeking your own well-being, your own safety, your own security, um, to meet your own needs, to satisfy your hunger and your thirst. We are born with instincts to do these things. This is how we love ourselves. We're always thinking about ourselves and our best interests. If we're honest, we all are. Whether we struggle with self-loathing or self-praise, we're always really thinking about ourselves and how to, again, preserve and perpetuate our own interests. So it seems that what Jesus is saying is that just as you are so naturally driven to love yourself and take care of yourself in these ways, you need to love your neighbor in the same way. Because we know that he couldn't be talking about feeling affection for your neighbor. He couldn't be talking about just liking your neighbor. He couldn't be talking about any kind of feelings towards your neighbor. That's not what we see modeled in scripture. It, regardless of feelings, we're to take care of our neighbor. We're to meet our neighbor's need, regardless of um, you know the affection we may or may not feel towards them. The love that we are called to have towards them is that of action. Um, and so it would make sense if the parallel is also the love of ourselves that is manifested in just things that we naturally do for ourselves. Um, and so this idea that you can't love other people until you feel a certain way for yourself um, it's just not true. It's just not biblical. And we would be waiting around for a really long time because all of us are going to struggle with insecurities and um, the people who actually need our love and need our care can't wait for us to you know, feel great about our body image or something like that. Hi, I'm Kirk Cameron. And thanks for watching the Kirk Cameron on TVN YouTube channel. We hope you enjoyed the video. A couple of things. Please make sure that you hit the subscribe button and tap the bell icon so that you're notified every time a new video is posted. And be sure to share your takeaway in the comments and invite a friend to join the conversation.